Our second lesson today, as you see, is from Paul's letter to the Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> Let us hear now the word of God. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the gospel, the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Well, the biblical letter of First Peter is a relatively unknown, seldom quoted New Testament book, but in consideration of what is going on in our world and in our nation, the challenges, the uncertainties, the tough times, I think it's amazingly relevant. Written about the middle of the first century CE to a group of churches in modern day Turkey, the writer of First Peter set out to encourage fellow Christians to persevere in their faith. They were being persecuted. Now persecution has many different forms. There can be a direct form of persecution where you're arrested and hauled off or you're subject to torture, beatings, or there can be indirect persecution where you are ostracized or shunned and made to feel like you do not belong. I think both of these things were going on with these Christians in the first century CE. In fact, they were exiles. They were exiles from their Christ and their Christian faith and ways of being did indeed made them stand out in their culture there in Asia Minor. They dressed differently, they prayed differently. Most of them were even Roman citizens and so it aroused the suspicions, sometimes the hostilities of their neighbors. In fact, a writer from that period predicted this would happen. As exiles, he writes, wrote, you shall be regarded as worthless, like useless water, until the time as the Most High visits the earth. This was the beleaguered community that First Peter, the letter, was written to. And so, as we begin to understand this group, this community, and what they were facing, we can understand also how they were beginning to fall away from their faith, how they were, how they were losing hope in the future. Now then, you and I are not exactly exiles, and no one is suspicious of us, but there are moments, I think, when we as Christians worry about our future as well and can lose hope. And like the congregation there in Asia Minor, we too find ourselves similarly discouraged. For example, when it comes to just the Christian church, we're constantly told to worry about its future. Church membership is dropping, not just in the Presbyterian Church USA, but in mainline churches, all churches. According to the Pew Forum, the percentage of U.S. adults who pray daily and regularly go to church or other religious services have all declined in recent years. Even Southern Baptists have lost a million members over the past 10 years. 
in our own PCUSA, which at one time was three million strong. Not a lot of people when you look at the rest of the population, but a strong church. It's about half that size now. It's been going on for decades. It's a slow leak. And we managed to hold on as best we can. And fortunately, St. Charles Avenue Presbyterian Church is doing well. We're grateful to God for that. And there are other exceptions around the country. Churches, almost all of them in larger cities, large churches. But the macro picture is still tough. It's a leak. Every day you wake up, <laughs> and if you care about the church, you worry because you know that you're just a little bit smaller than you were the day before. And you worry about the future. What's going to happen? Where are we going? So I think their question 2,000 years ago is really kind of our question today. So then in comes this letter, 1 Peter, and I'm going to read just the opening lines of 1 Peter. But I, as I do, I want you to notice not only the substance, but especially the confident tone of what this brother in Christ writes to his brothers in the faith, not only then, but now. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. That's how First Peter comes out of the box. Not one iota of concern or fear at all, not a trace. Absolute confidence about the future. So then writing about the same time to a similarly anxious congregation in Rome, the Apostle Paul says essentially the same thing as we heard in our second lesson. And to paraphrase what Paul says is, it's bad out there. It's not easy. You're really going through it. But hang in there, Paul says. Hang in there. Faith is worth it. Its end game is hope. Hope through the risen Christ. Hope. Always, forever, hope. And I think that's a word that we don't hear very much these days out there. But let me tell you what, you hear it a lot in here. And therefore, I think we need to be reminded once in a while that we are people of hope and that we belong to a God of hope. And how can we be so confident about this? How do we know this? Because as disciples of the one whom God raised from the dead, you and I are privy to how the story ends. And it ends well. It ends in resurrection. It doesn't end in death, but in new life. Therefore, since we know how this story ends, will end, we can be very confident and boldly so about the future and even brash about it, impudent. Preacher Tom Long recently called my attention to a moving and beautiful memoir <clears throat> written in the early 1980s entitled Intensive Care. In it, Mary Lou Wiseman tells the moving and tragic story of the death of her 15-year-old son, Peter, from the terrible disease muscular dystrophy. 
filled with accounts of getting up in the middle of the night to take him to the bathroom or simply to reposition his body. It's, it's an incredible story of the power of love, both of parents for their beloved child and of the child's return of that faithful love. Toward the end of the book, she tells of an astonishing moment. It happened right at the moment of Peter's death. By this time, Peter was completely paralyzed. His parents were there to comfort him, to see to his needs, to move his body, to position his body when he asked to be moved into a different position. The delirium of death was taking over. Marianne recalls that his voice sounded lost and far away and that he was moaning and speaking insensibly, but then suddenly, in a surprisingly clear voice, Peter spoke directly to Larry, his father. Daddy, what does the word impudent mean? Startled and confused, Larry and Mary Lou looked at each other. What could this strange question from their dying son possibly mean? Daddy, what does impudent mean? And Larry, with tears in his eyes, said to his son, impudent, it means bold, shamelessly bold. And Peter paused for a moment, death closing its grip, when he said, then put me in an impudent position. So just before he died, Larry and Mary Lou gently positioned Peter in a posture of bold defiance. An impudent position in the face of death. Now this story, I believe, has much to tell us about our Christian faith. Christian hope is a kind of brazen, impudent, spiritual position, an attitude over anything that threatens to undo us, especially death. Christian hope is an impudent hope. Now, it's important at this point to clarify what we mean by Christian hope. Christian hope. Christian hope is not something sweet and mild. Christian hope is not wishful thinking. I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, or I hope I get invited to that party, or I hope I make that putt. <laughs> no. Christian hope is not even about progress, human progress, human potential, the hope that through our own efforts, you and I can make the world a better place. Like the worthy hope that good and consistent diplomatic efforts will one day bring peace on earth. Or the hope, the worthy hope that between private initiative and public engagement, we can end world hunger. Those are all great things to hope for and to work toward, but when the word hope is modified by the adjective Christian, we're talking about something else. Christian hope is not hope in us. It's hope in God. And not just any God, but in fact the God who raised Jesus from the dead, that God. That's that God. And as such, it becomes our hope for our own resurrection, the resurrection of our own bodies and life everlasting for each of us, or as First Peter puts it, the birth of a new and living hope. Christian hope. Christian hope. But Christian hope is also cosmic. It has a cosmic global dimension. Uh, Christian hope is hope for the world. That through the risen Christ, the God who created the heavens and the earth at the beginning will 
finish that new creation at the end. It is the hope that Christ will one day come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. This, then, is what we mean by Christian hope. It's personal and it's corporate. And when we think of how radical and daring it is, how it is, how its odds, according to the world, are really ridiculously long, improbable if not impossible, then really it's, as they say, it's hoping against hope. It's hoping for something that we know is not going to happen, and yet we continue to hope for it. That over and against all available evidence, disease, hatred, bigotry, division, deceit, over against these and everything else, love wins. Life will prevail over death because of what God has done and what God will do, usher in a day when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream and mourning and crying and pain will be no more and death will be no more. Christian hope, that's our hope. That's our hope. And this we do affirm with a kind of cocksureness from a position of spiritual impudence. Defiant to the end in the face of the worst that life can throw at us. And we can afford to do this because we know how the story ends, and it ends well. I'll die, wrote Emily Dickinson, but that's all that I'll do for death. Many years ago, my wife's father, Dick Harvin, was diagnosed with a particularly deadly form of cancer. A little over a year later, sure enough, after many treatments and with family at his bedside, he died. And so we all went back to South Carolina and to his hometown for the funeral service in the sanctuary of his beloved church. <clears throat> and then drove out to the cemetery just down the road from his house. After the benediction, <clears throat> after the uh, graveside was over, uh, family members just kind of hung around, and we were just telling stories about Dick Harvin. He was a colorful guy, and there were lots and lots of stories to tell about him, and we were sitting there telling him. You know, usually funeral directors want you to leave so they can finish, you know, doing what they do. And we just stayed and so we just watched them continue their work as we sat there and told Dick Harvin stories. Most of the stories about him, in fact, were about his best friend, John Jones, who ironically had predeceased Dick by only a few months. And Dick and John were best friends, as we said, but they were, they were also, as often happens with best friends, fierce rivals. They were always trying to outdo each other. For example, were John Jones to get a new wool sport coat and wear it to church one Sunday, kind of preening around the sanctuary, the next Sunday Dick would have a new one on himself, only his would be silk. Or were Dick to purchase Golf Digest's hot new putter for that season and bring it to his foursome on that Saturday, sure enough, the next Saturday, John Jones would have the very same putter, only his would be emblazoned with his initials. So we're telling these stories back and forth, and about that time, the funeral director, I guess he wanted us to leave, I don't know, but he came over and he said, did you hear what Dick told me about his funeral? And we said, no. You know, he said, well, as it turns out, shortly before he died, Dick summoned the funeral director to his house to make arrangements. And so I sat down with him and I said, well, Dick, what kind of casket would you like? Just like John Jones's, he said, only a little bit nicer. 
okay, then where would you like to be buried? Right, right beside John Jones, he said, right beside John Jones. Okay, now, what kind of tombstone would you like? Let me see what John picked out. Okay, I'll take that, but I want mine in pink granite and polish it up, if you don't mind. And so we chuckled over this, but then we glanced over to our right as we were still out there at the cemetery, and sure enough, there was John Jones's plot. Now, for the purposes of comparison, we, most of us never saw John Jones's casket, but one or two had, and they all said that Dick's was a little bit nicer than John's. And so we looked at where John <clears throat> was buried. As we said, it's right next to Dick's, but it was on slightly higher ground, this we noticed. But then we checked out his marker, <laughs> and it too was identical, only Dick's was polished in pink granite. A little nicer. And we just broke out laughing. We couldn't help ourselves. Laughing, 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 till tears came down. Was that wrong? Was that inappropriate? Right there with the dirt still fresh? I don't think so. I think it was being faithful, impudently so. For on a deep level, we disciples of Jesus Christ were laughing in the face of death. Confidently, brazenly laughing. Joanna Adams, by the way, calls this Easter laughter. Laughter that in and of itself bears witness to an empty tomb and to the singular power of God to snatch life from the very jaws of death. Christian hope is the conviction that death does not have the last word. Jesus Christ has the last word, and that last word is life. Christian hope is the impudent, brazen confidence that God is bringing in a new day against the forces of darkness. Christian hope causes us also to do some outlandish, faithfully foolish things that wherever there is warfare, we Christians stand up and speak a word of peace because we are people of hope. Wherever there is division or where people are trying to divide us, we stand up and we say, no, we need to be united here. We need to reconcile with one another and be one because we are people of hope. Wherever there is hatred, we Christians, we Christians work for reconciliation. Wherever there is suffering and despair and disease, we Christians are called to get to work to bring comfort and care and relief and to pray for healing because we are people of hope. We believe that God, the God who created, is already making a new creation and that it's just a matter of time before it will be finished. And so in the meantime, we live by hope, we walk by hope, we make our plans by hope, we share the hope. Why? Well, because we know how this story ends, and it ends well. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have given us new and living hope in Jesus Christ. Help us to know that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, shall be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.